Yom Teruah. It's a festival. Or is it Rosh Hashanah? Friends, as we unpack today, the fifth of seven of the Moedim, the appointed festivals that the scripture talks about, uh, it's not just for Judaism, friends. We are part of the Judeo-Christian ethic. It's an epic too, but it's an ethic, friends. And I want you to know this is going to give you a whole insight into Jesus, into the word, and into the new covenant like you've never seen before. I don't know if you know this, but um, did you know if I didn't have the New Testament, and I thank God for the New Testament. Friends, I mean, it just lays it out. There are things we know that we didn't understand or the Jews missed in the Old Covenant. So thank God for the New Covenant, man. (laughs) That's why we're born again. That's why we're filled with the Holy Spirit. That's key. But here's what I know, and here's what I want you to know today. There is an insight that if you only had the Old Testament... Did you know you still could accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Raise your hand if you knew that. If you never had the New Testament. Because the early church didn't have the New Testament. In 63 AD, we had a couple books of the Bible through a guy named Marcion who was a Gnostic, which means he was a heretic, but he also had an insight into canon and actually determining what is Scripture and what isn't. But did you know when the Apostle Paul led people to Christ, when Peter led people to Christ, when Barnabas led people to Christ, when, no matter who it was, friends, when John, who lived the longest out of the group, led people to Christ, they exclusively used the Old Testament. Oh, they talked about, as you know, in the book of Acts, infallible proofs, things they saw and touched and experienced. But did you know you can lead people to Christ? Uh, look at, look, I mean, just look at Isaiah 53. You've got the suffering servant. Who would believe our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Friends, we see Jesus and the virgin birth in Isaiah 53. Did you know you could preach about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ just by going to Zechariah 12.10, Psalm 22, and again, Isaiah 53. Friends, the insights, you can find the Trinity just by going to Genesis 1.26. And we shall create man in our image after our likeness. Did you know that you find Jesus in the very first verse of Genesis 1.1? In better sheet, that's the book of beginnings or Genesis, where you actually have Jesus spelled Aleph, the first letter, the Alpha. But in Hebrew, it's Aleph. And Tau, and that is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And Jesus says, I'm the Alpha and Omega. In Hebrew, it's I'm the Aleph and the Tau. You see that, friends, hundreds of times, actually over 7,000 times throughout the Old Testament when you know Hebrew. It's kind of an interesting thing. Do you know a little Hebrew? Me. I'm a little Hebrew. But anyway, friends, I want you to really grab hold of it today. We're going to get into something that I believe in our churches today, for the most part, we've lost. I believe within our Messianic congregations and in our Hebrew Roots congregations, some of them overstate the point, and we get into Pharisaism, legalism, and bondage, and we get into the letter of the law instead of the spirit of the law. Today, we're going to rejoice that we worship the Lord on Resurrection Sunday, but we're also going to recognize the Sabbath. The Shabbat is important, but we're going to realize that the Sabbath isn't just Friday sundown to Saturday sundown, because the Bible, Jesus said, listen, man wasn't made for the Sabbath. This is when he was accused of breaking a law. He said the Sabbath was made for man, and Jesus actually told us every day, is a Sabbath. We're to enter into Jesus, our Sabbath rest. So welcome to Yom Teruah. Actually, it concluded last night at sundown, but friends, it's important. We're going to cover a little bit about Yom Teruah versus Rosh Hashanah, Rosh's head. Rosh Hashanah, Hashanah is head of Ha is the, Ashana is year. So Rosh Hashanah is head of the year. And we're going to talk about a Jewish secular holiday that the Jews call as, they call it a high holiday. I'm going to argue some of them were high when they called it a high holiday. And here's why, friends. It's not in the Bible. It's nowhere in the Bible. No, it's not there. Because, friends, uh, when we have the first three Moedim, which takes place around March, sometimes April, you have, what is it, uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread, then you have Pesach and First Fruit. We don't have Easter in the Bible. Did you know that? We actually have First Fruit. Jesus, the first 
fruit raised from the dead. Easter is actually named after a pagan goddess. And I'm not putting you down, call it what you will. I understand we're kind of used to that. But we're going to get a real sense, a real sense of insight, even into the return of Christ. What is this Yom Teruah all about? Before we move on, I do want to thank you for what's been just incredible commitment to the work of the Lord here. You guys have been so involved. And since Yom Teruah literally means the day of blowings, The day of blowings. That's why, did you know one of the Hebrew words for worship, or actually for praise, is teruah. It's the shout of the Lord. There's another Hebrew word for shouting, and that's shabach, whole different thing. When the walls came tumbling down at the walls of Jericho, do you know the Jews actually went seven days and didn't say a word, and then they all yelled, teruah! It was worship. And the walls imploded on a superpower. An incredible thing, isn't it? It's an incredible thing. And I want you to see this today. When you look at Yom Teruah, there's something the Lord wants us to see. I want to ask you, in your life, in your family, what wall needs to come down right now? A wall of separation, a wall of bigotry, a wall of financial disaster, a wall of physical, I mean, uh, just you're, you're, you need healing. You need the Lord to move. A wall of stinking thinking. Today, as we look at Yom Teruah, we're going to get a sense of what is this concept of why would God say one of the appointed feasts, which he says, by the way, we're to celebrate forever. He says it'll never pass away. But we're going to get a sense of what that means today. Why in the world would he say this will never pass? Well, in the Messianic movement, the Hebrew Roots movement, they think by actually celebrating these holidays and celebrating these appointed feasts that somehow or other makes us closer to God. May I submit to you, in the same way as Gentiles, we have pagan holidays we celebrate. We have pagan festivals that we celebrate. Among the Jews, there are things that they celebrate where they've missed the spirit of the law. Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. He came to what? Fulfill, that's right. He came to fulfill the law. And so we're going to get a sense of how is it we can keep the Moedim, these appointed festivals that in Leviticus 23, beginning with the first verse, that we're called to keep and honor God. Well, let me show you something. Did you know you're keeping Passover right now? You're keeping the Pesach. You're keeping the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Pesach every time you have communion. Remember when Jesus said during the Passover Seder, he said, do this in remembrance of me because you're going to be showing forth the Lord's death until he returns, until he comes. But what was he really saying? What was he really saying? He was saying, I'm choosing Passover to institute communion. Why was he doing that? Why was he doing this to institute communion? He said, well, what's, what's the Passover all about? It wasn't just to show forth the Lord's death. You see, Jesus not only said, I'm the resurrection and the life, he says, I am the sacrificial lamb. I'm slain from before the foundations of the world. I am, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And finally, I'm the lamb of God who sits at the right hand of God the Father. So what is Jesus doing here? He says, every time you take communion, you're keeping two out of three of the Moedim. Don't tell, hey, listen, my Jewish brothers and sisters, my Messianic brothers and sisters, I've pastored you. I love you. I'm for you. But don't tell me that Sunday is not every bit as valid as Sabbath. Sunday does not replace the Sabbath. The Apostle Paul kept the Sabbath from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown in order to lead Jews into the kingdom. But on Sunday, he celebrated freedom, the resurrection, the resurrection. Resurrection Sunday is also very viable. And remember this, as we learn about Yom Teruah, there's always a New Testament fulfillment. But when you can begin to see Jesus in the Old Testament, oh, read Daniel 9. Man, when you can see him in Zechariah 12, 10. When you can see him in Isaiah 6, when you can see him in Isaiah 11, when you can see him in Isaiah 53, you begin to realize from Genesis 1-1 all the way to Revelation 28, it all oozes the spirit of Jesus. So Yom Teruah, 
But we're not going to really talk about Rosh Hashanah. Now, this is what's important. When we look at this Moedim, most Jews, traditional Jews, do not accept or do not celebrate, rather, Yom Teruah. It's the fifth Moedim. It's the appointed festival. And here's what the seven Moedim have in common. They all lead to Jesus. Jesus is the unleavened Messiah. He's without sin, who became a sin offering for you and me. Here you see he's the sacrificial lamb, Pesach. Number three, we see uh, first fruit. He is the resurrected one. Then we go to Shavuot when we were given the Holy Spirit. When you get the Holy Spirit in your life, do you not know your body is the temple of God and the Holy Spirit dwells within you? Uh, also being baptized in the Holy Spirit, that's Pentecost, Shavuot. Then the fifth one, Yom Teruah. We're going to get a sense of the blowing of the trumpet. Think of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And the trumpet will blow, the shofar will blow, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And we which remain shall be caught up with the Lord. So shall we ever be with the Lord. And then we move to Yom Kippur, where we want to make sure, and I'm talking about that next Sunday night, that our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. The Jews believe there were three different books. We'll talk about that next week. And then number seven, Sukkot. This is when Jesus, think of this, Sukkot is a festival of tabernacles or booths. What does the Bible say? And the word became flesh, incarnation, and dwelt among us. It's Sukkot when uh, most Bible scholars believe Jesus was born. We know he could not have been born at Christmas. I know I'm going to step on toes right now if I get into Christmas trees. Don't read um, <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 10. But if I start talking about Christmas, maybe you get warm fuzzies and you think it's the birth of Jesus. Well, the problem is it's not the birth of Jesus. It would be Sukkot because the Bible says he tabernacled among us. It's also when the marriage supper of the Lamb takes place. I can't wait to get into that in just a couple short weeks. I'm a little hyper today. I'm into this. I'm excited, friends. Yes, I was brought up in a conservative Jewish family. As many of you know, when my friends got caught smoking dope, I got caught eating pork ribs behind the garage. <laughs> and so, friends, I want you to just see where Jesus fits into this. Yom Ter so Rosh Hashanah, why is there even a Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year? First of all, it's seven months late. It, just like the Jews get it wrong, as to when the new year is, the new year takes place in the month of Nisan. And uh, I don't mean the car, the Nisans, but um, that's when it takes place. It doesn't take place in the seventh month. But here's what happened. When the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, the Jews no longer could celebrate Yom Teruah. Because when you blow that trumpet, it was to be at the Temple Mount, and it was to be a place of celebrating the temple and the coming of the Messiah in the appropriate time and season. But once that took place, the Jews no longer had a temple. And think of this. If you know Jews today and, say, and, and they say, we're Jews, we're biblical Jews, ask them this question. Leviticus 17.11 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There's no remi remitting. There is no forgiveness of sins. And so I'll ask Jews, well, how do you atone for your sins now? How do you even do Yom Kippur without any blood, without any place to make a sacrifice? You don't have the Temple Mount. You've got, you got a Muslim mosque over there right now. And the Temple Mount doesn't have the temple. It was destroyed in 70 A.D. And they say, oh, we bring a sacrifice of praise. We bring a sacrifice of worship. It sounds wonderful, but scripturally, it doesn't answer the question. God had the temple destroyed for a reason, not just because the Jews were heretical and apostate, and I'm a Jew, not putting them down, but the temple was destroyed because Jesus now gave us a better covenant based on sure promises, better than the blood of bulls and goats and heifers and turtle doves. Once and for all, we have the perfect blood of Jesus Christ. To my Messianic brothers and sisters today, I'm one of you. To my Hebrew roots brothers and sisters, I'm one of you. Here's one of the problems we have. Many of us are trying to so do our due diligence in keeping these Moedim just as the Jews did. But you have to understand, if we don't solve the blood issue, here's the problem. Pesach, Feast of Unleavened Bread, there's two of them. And then we move all the way to Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur. Actually, it would be irrelevant. 
Why do we celebrate Yom Kippur today? Well, you got to find that out next week, but we no longer have that blood. Or do we? If you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, if you really believe he died for your sins, then we still celebrate these festivals, but in a whole different way. If you are interested or excited about this potential teaching right now, come on, lift your hand up. Can you see anything here that could be of any value? Well, we'll see in a moment. Back in the 1960s, President John F. Kennedy told this story to the media when they were second-guessing his administration's policies and decisions. And listen to the story that he told. There once was a legendary ball player who never failed to hit, who never made an error, who never dropped a fly, Ground balls never dribbled between his legs. Wouldn't you like to have this guy on your team? He had an arm like a bullwhip with, and which threw with unerring accuracy. He never missed a sign, and he never had a mental lapse on the base pads. What a guy, man. In fact, he would be in the Hall of Fame today, except for one thing. One thing. What could that be? No one was ever able to get him to put his drink and hot dog down and come out of the press box to play. We're going to share about a call today as we look at Yom Teruah, a call to get into the game. But I want to, again, get you to hear this. Rosh Hashanah, head of the year, it happened seven months before the Jews celebrated. Rosh Hashanah is a replacement for Yom Teruah to the Jews because they said, we don't have the Temple Mount. We don't have the blood to make a sacrifice. So let's change the head of the year by seven months. Friends, that's not unusual. The Jews did that. You're thinking, what's wrong with these Jews? How dumb can you get and still breathe? Before you pick on the Jews, what did we do? We took an October birth, and we in the church said, no, 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 it happened at the winter solstice. It happened in December. We forget the realities of the emperors. We forget Constantine. We forget the fact that these guys so wanted Gentiles to come into Christianity that they made the decision to accept Babylonian, Roman, Greek, and even Hittite thinking. They decided to bring all this other stuff into the gospel called syncretism, and that's something we want to be careful of. Now, there's these two key Jewish holidays that are being observed during the season. And what are they again? Yom Teruah and Rosh Hashanah. And kids, you know, the nice thing about being a Jew, man, we used to look forward to the high holidays. That was Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. We never even knew about Yom Teruah because we got to miss school. Man, we loved it. It's like, you know, the Catholics, they refer to people that go to school as there's Catholics and public. Catholics and publics, we Jews, man, when we would get our note to be able to miss congregation, or not, to be able to, 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 to miss school and to stay home and do all these other things, we thought we had heaven. Now, I'm going to put some Hebrew words up for you today, and I want you to watch carefully. Yom Teruah, and you can see in, in, in Hebrew we read from right to left. Not left to right, but right to left. And so you see the word Yom Teruah, and I also put in here Rosh Hashanah, meaning head of the year. I'm only bringing this up, not because it's biblical, but I want to show you what happens when in the church or in Judaism, we decide to add holidays, add festivals, add rituals, add rites, add sacraments that God never endorsed, and say, well, I just love it, and it's my family tradition. You watch it. So remember, Rosh Hashanah is the head of of the Jewish civil new year. That's it. It occurs on the first day of Tishra, which generally falls in September, where we're at right now. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 2, Nisan is regarded as the head of the year. Now, that's interesting. The Jews celebrate not in Nisan, which is the head of the year. They don't celebrate New Year's then. They just move it seven months out. Hold on to that thought. So what would happen during Yom Teruah? And that's what we're really going to hit. The Jews would have two silver trumpets. I'll show you what this means in a moment. And one ram's horn called the what? Shofar. Not a chauffeur, but a shofar. 
shofar. Let's get that right. Now, the shofar, as we learn in Numbers 10, verse 8, always represents God. Write that down. Later on, look at Numbers 10, 8. One silver trumpet, okay, always represented humanity. If you read Leviticus and you read Numbers and you look at Exodus, you're going to see this. One silver trumpet, it represents humanity. And one silver trumpet always represented angelic beings. Let's see why that's important. Some believe uh, that one silver trumpet is the tribe of Judah, and the other would be the tribes of Israel, uh, and that they're being called back to Elohim. And there is an argument for this, because Judah means what in Hebrew? Judah, Yehuda, means praise. So some believe that's what the silver trumpets meant. Well, you can go either way. So I want to talk about a different kind of new year. Now, the Jewish New Year, we're bringing Rosh Hashanah into this to understand Yom Teruah. Uh, the Jewish New Year is celebrated in a very solemn way. Now, let me tell you a little bit. I grew up at uh, Rodfai Shalom and then Rodfai Zedek as, as the temples. And uh, it was always an interesting thing. Uh, we would come together, and we called this the Jewish High Holidays. Now, this is where, in the Jewish temple, the congregations made serious bank. If you ever walk into a Jewish congregation, you'll see on the back of every seat, every seat is in honor of an individual. And so for our family, we only had two seats for mom and dad. You didn't have them for the kids. We'd have to sit in the overflow, the fellowship hall, because in most Jewish temples, you open up the rear partition, and that's where the kids would sit, and that's where people that never paid for the high holiday seats. See, the Jewish temple, they don't have the tithes and offerings the way we have it, so they charge you, if you want to come to congregation on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and if you want to come to the congregation for Rosh Hashanah, it was show me the money, Jerry Maguire Berg, or Maguire Steen, if you will. And so, um, and, and when we would go to the temple for these high holidays, we would be in the temple for approximately eight hours. I mean, it's an all-day thing. And for Yom Kippur, when you would sacrifice and fast and um, deny your body, you could be there many more hours beyond that. Now, they, they, what happens at this point, and I'm going to show you a few stories here before we really get into this. It's during this period of time, we call this the 10 Days of Awe. From when Yom Teruah begins to when it's, it comes to a conclusion with Yom Kippur, uh, an individual would examine the record of their past year, and they would make resolutions to do better. Now, here's a tragedy with the law right now. The Bible makes it clear when it comes to the law of God. Without the shedding of blood, no remission of sins, and it's a time to get right with God. It's a time to ask, is my name written in the Lamb's book of life? His name was Wayne. The restaurant was just like Benihana's, a Japanese restaurant where they make the food in front of you, tip on cooking, and he worked at a place called House of Kobe. Elohim, our God, got a hold of Wayne, and uh, I began to share with him during the 10 days of awe. We were sitting there. He found out I was a pastor, and he had enough knowledge to ask me a little bit about my Jewish background. He didn't understand, but Elohim got a hold of him while he was cooking our food, which scares me because he's throwing around these metal salt and pepper shakers and doing his acrobatic presentation. And then he has these knives he's throwing up in the air. And I mean, it's a, it, and he's playing with fire. But anyway, Elohim got a hold of him when he was cooking our food in, uh, in uh, Sherville, Indiana, at the house of Kobe. And he began to weep while he was cooking. And he repented of his sins as we talked about it. And here's what's important. He planned, okay, or we planned that night when we went to the house of Kobe back in 1984, he actually planned on, uh, we planned, Marge and I and the friends we were with, we planned on going to a different restaurant. We were with a couple that we adore, Bob and Cindy Stock. And all of a sudden we're there and he's asking me about Jesus. He's asking me about Yeshua HaMashiach. And he's cooking our food, and he's weeping in with his arm. He's wiping the tears away. And we did not miss our opportunity. You remember when Jesus wept over Jerusalem? He says, oh, Jerusalem, like a mother hen, if you would have just listened to me, 
I would have gathered you under my wings. I would have saved you. I would have made a difference. But what does he say? But you missed your day of visitation. How often do we miss our day of visitation? So Wayne was evaluating his work. He had once been a dynamic Christian. He had once served the Lord, he told us, and he knew he wasn't right with the Lord. He says, when I look at myself and I look in the balances, I'm coming up weak. I'm coming up light. I'm coming up short. Is it not possible that Elohim wants us to evaluate our walk and ask ourselves some important questions and reevaluate our walk with him and see Where do I stand with the Lord? What I do enjoy about Judaism and what I do enjoy about the Messianic movement is when we come to Yom Teruah, to Yom Kippur, the 10 days of awe, it's a time of really saying, if Jesus returned today, would my name be written in the Lamb's book of life? Where am I at with the Lord? I think it's a great thing. It's a time of saying, where are we at? But here's what's exciting. Wayne fell on his knees right there in Sherrillville, Indiana, right there at the house of Kobe, where he's the chef, and he ended up coming to our church. But this guy repented. I mean, there was wailing. There was gnashing of the teeth. If he would have had sackcloth, honey, he would have put it on right there. It was an exciting time, and it was right here during the 10 days of awe. And I want to ask you, right now as you look at your life, I've not even told you about Yom Teruah. Not really yet. I haven't gotten that. Well, yeah, Yom Kippur is next Sunday night. And if you get a chance, I believe it's this coming Friday, we're going to be in the Zoom room. You want to be there for the prayer meeting. I just led one yesterday, and then I did a Facebook Live as well. But, I mean, we had a one-hour prayer meeting, and it was incredible, and I taught on Yom uh, Teruah. I'll be doing the same with Yom Kippur this next Friday. Please be there and, and invite others. And then on Uh, Right afterwards, I'm going to go live on Facebook Live, and we're really going to get into, what about Yom Kippur? Yom is day, Kippur is coverings, atonement. It's a day of, of, of really Jesus getting us to inspect our own lives, to be introspective. And I want to ask you, if you were to ask yourself today, let's imagine the 10 days of awe. Right now, let's say the 10 days of awe. This is your last chance to evaluate your life and say, if Jesus returned, is my name written in the Lamb's book of life? Would I go before the great white throne of judgment where I'm damned, or am I going to stand before the other throne where I receive my gifts, I receive my crowns, I receive my blessings? Where are we at? Do you know, you can be so sick. I can be so sick and not even know it. This is when a Jewish family asks the question, where are my kids at with the Lord right now if the Lord return? You know, there was a gal that um, Marge and I ministered to uh, back in uh, Chicago. So this is going back over 32 years ago. Man, love her. And she lived a long time with AIDS. She had a one-night stand. It was with her boy. Actually, it wasn't a one-night stand. She had a boyfriend. She was a godly woman. She was in our youth group for years. Now she was in our college age group. She was a professional. And yet there was this one day, a moment of weakness, she made a wrong decision. Now, it was years later, she came to see Marge and myself, and she said, it turns out I've had AIDS probably for the last eight years, and I never knew it. As horrible of a disease as it is now, It was the dreaded disease then. This is the concept of Yom Teruah. That's the beginning of the 10 days of awe. Where am I at with the Lord? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But here is a woman who didn't even know she had AIDS. And then all of a sudden sniffles began. And there was this sense of losing her equilibrium. And she realized as she evaluated her life that she was sick unto death. Now, let me help you out with Yom Teruah right now. The Jews always believed, and I am talking about Yom Kippur, but I'm really going to talk about it next week. They've always believed that Elohim has three books. And I would agree with this. Three books. Number one was the fate of the wicked. That means it's too late. It's too late, baby. It's over. The party is over. They also believed there was 
the book of the righteous or the Lamb's book of life. And then they believed an intermediate book is also recorded. And that is where maybe you're in, maybe you're out. Seek the Lord while he may yet still be found. The goodness of God leads to repentance. Um, right now we're at a place of saying, God, like King David, blot out my transgressions, make me white as snow. My sin is forever before my eyes. God, if you'll get me out of this, I'm in the valley of indecision. If you'll get me out of this, I will teach sinners your way. Now, the names of the righteous are immediately inscribed, and they are at once sealed to life. That's called the Lamb's Book of Life. That one, we have to go back to the first Moedim, Passover, Pesach, Feast of Unleavened Bread, the first two Moedim. And why do we have to do this, friends? Because the Lamb's Book of Life actually comes from Passover. That's why Jesus says, listen, I'm the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Uh, here, you, here, here you've got um, John talking about the Lamb of God slain before the foundations of the world. And then finally it says, Behold the Lamb of God who sits at the right hand of the Lord, the Father, if you will. Now, the middle class, they call this individuals who maybe they're going to be saved, maybe they're not going to be saved. The middle class, that in-between group, are given 10 days. And the days of what we call awe, yamim. It's actually, the days of awe are yamim, norim. Ya, 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 yamim, norim. Which is, okay, till the day of atonement. This is, this is the 10 days of awe. So when I use this term right here, yamim, norim, and you've got it up there in the Hebrew, I believe. Is it up there? Oh, baby. My Hebrew's getting better here. It literally is... Um, the 10 days of awe. So it's between Yom Teruah and what is it? Yom Kippur, if you will. And they were given 10 days to repent. It doesn't mean if they didn't repent that they couldn't still be saved. What it meant was every year the Jews are to believe there's only 10 days. Achad, Shaim, Shalosh, Arba, Hamesh, Sheish, Sheva, Tesha, Mona, Esther. 10 days. 10 in Hebrew. And it was, you were always to look at your life and say, where am I at with the Lord? Let's pretend I'm in the, right there in the middle, stuck in the middle with you. And if Jesus returned, would I be saved? Would I be right with God? I think it's a good practice. Every year you do this. And the whole concept was like the 10 virgins, five foolish Five wise, that story is actually told during the 10 days of awe. That story is being told during Yom Teruah. And it was saying, hey, this is the New Testament concept of work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It was during this time you would say, where am I at with the Lord? And so the concept was in Judaism, the Jew was only given 10 days to repent, which would make sense if Jesus returned during that period of time. The wicked are at once blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. It's important we still grab hold of this. Um, Luke chapter 10, verse 20 says, Nevertheless, don't be glad that the spirits, these demonic spirits, submit to you. But what does it say? Be glad your names have been recorded in what? What? What is it? Heaven. That's talking about the Lamb's book of life. So here's the important thing I want you to see today. When we look at Yom Teruah, say that with me. Yom is day, Teruah is blowing. It's the blowing of the trumpet. It's the first Thessalonians chapter 4, when you see the blowing of the shofar and the dead in Christ rising first. I want you to take a moment right now and look at this. Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? I think the Jews give us an insight here. God knows they need their names to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And they can't do this based on good deeds. They can't do it based on a Jewish understanding of the righteous. They can only do this by knowing Jesus as Lord and Savior. But right now, here's a question. If the Lord returned today, are you confident that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life? What's your supporting evidence? This is, the, the Jew took this so serious. They didn't put makeup on during this time. They didn't wash their face during this time. I know you're going to freak out. It's gross. They didn't even brush their teeth.
teeth during this period of time. Oh, it sounds like somebody you've been dating, same thing. Well, that's another story, okay? But you have to ask this question. Is your name recorded in heaven? Is your name recorded in heaven because you say so, because I say so, because we're afraid of the alternatives? Just hold on to that. You see, Yom Teruah is called a wake-up call. Say that with me. A wake-up call. The most important feature of the ceremony is the blowing of the ram's horn and two silver trumpets, which marks the preparation of the festival. What does the Bible mean? What did you think it meant when it said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? It's not cheap grace. It's not easy believism. Friends, the Lord loves you. He died for your sins. He wouldn't that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. All should come to everlasting life. I know you believe that. But we have to take that moment and say, what does it mean to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? The Jew believes that the shofar is to arouse them to the reality of their sinfulness. Have you, I think I've got a shofar sitting here somewhere. I'm just not sure where it's at. If Maddie finds it later on, I'm going to bring it over here, but I'm not going to blow it. I'm going to have Evelyn, who's with us tonight, come up here and blow the shofar. It's what's called a worship act of futility. So I won't do that to you, Evelyn. And so good to have you here, Evelyn. We just love you. And here's what I do know. Your husband, who recently has preceded you and is uh, standing before the, to be absent in the bodies, to be present with the Lord, I know Roger's name is written in the Lamb's book of life. But here it is, friends, and I want you to hear this. Um, the, the Jew believes there's 10 days. I'm going to say it over and over, and that's the 10 days of awe. And that was the remedy of the dilemma. The Lord wasn't saying, and I don't want you to think today, if I don't get this thing right in 10 days, I'm in trouble. That's not what I want you to do. But there will come a day, friends, the last trumpet will be blown. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And I want you to stop and think today, not because the church tells you you're saved and the pastor tells you you're saved, and I'm not here to say that your salvation is so fragile that you might not be saved, but imagine these 10 days. Imagine if you'd work out and I'd work out my own salvation with fear and trembling. You see, friends, it was the shofar that would lead a Jew, Rabbi Akiba tells us, uh, it would lead a Jew, to, it, would, it would provoke a Jew, or to provoke one another to good works, to lead a godly life. I want you just to just imagine this, if every year, instead of just saying, once saved, always saved, instead of just being so confident of your salvation, regardless of your lifestyle, I want you to imagine if we actually had to look at the man in the mirror, the woman in the mirror, and say, is my life really glorifying God? Do I really know the Lord? The ram's horn is also a summons to conscience to awaken and heed the call to duty. Now remember, there were the ten virgins. You remember the five who were intelligent? They had wisdom. They were prepared. And five who were foolish and were not prepared. And, and so it literally would awaken them to heed the call to duty, but also it was the trumpets used as a sign for the return of the Messiah. All this is taking place. And I want to ask you right now, if you were to hear the trumpet right now, that's what the five foolish virgins heard. They heard the trumpet and they weren't ready. They weren't prepared. And the temple door was shut. Do you know when the Bible says no man knows the time, only the Father's in heaven for the return of Christ? It actually doesn't mean that nobody can know the time. You're not going to get the exact date, but actually Matthew 24 tells us to look to the heavens and look to the signs and look to all the cosmological things that are happening uh, up in the heavens. And we know that our salvation draweth nigh, our redemption draweth nigh. What it was saying was at Yom Teruah, it was always on a new moon. It's a double Shabbat, a double Sabbath. And the Sabbath is sacred, but the Lord said, this is a double Sabbath. I want you to be ready. I want you to be prepared. But here's what it means. No one knows the time, only the Father is in heaven. 
Whenever there's a new moon, there's two possible days it can happen on. Come say that with me. Two days. Two days. Two days. And he says, nobody knows whether it's this day or that day. Will it be on Friday night? Will it be on Saturday night? When's it going to happen? That's all that's being said right here. So let me show you how the trumpet for Yom Teruah, and we see this with the ten virgins, was also used as a sign for the return of the Messiah. First Thessalonians 4.16. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a rousing cry, with a call from one of the ruling angels, and with God's shofar. Those who died united with the Messiah, I'm taking this right from the Hebrew, will be the first to rise, or the dead in Christ will rise first. Let me tell you why this was important. There was a problem happening in the early church. The Jews always taught that if we were alive when the Messiah returned, if we, oh, I like this, guys. Look at this. Oh, come on, designer shofar. There it is. Mm, that's as much as I'm going to do. So, so it, it literally, if a Jew was alive when the Messiah returned, that you would be in a preferential position in heaven. You'd be closer to the throne. You'd have a better opportunity as far as what your privileges would be on the other side of eternity. And they believed that if you were dead, it's not that you didn't still go to heaven, but you would not have the same position. Why is this important? Let me tell you. Do you remember when, John, when, when Jesus told Peter? When Jesus told Peter, um, you know, Peter, you're going to go through persecution. This is right before Jesus ascended to be with the Father. You're going to go through persecution. You're going to go through trials. You're going to go through testings. You're going to be crucified. They're going to do it to you upside down, we're told historically. All these horrible things are going to happen. Peter comes up with the ultimate question. He looks at John the Revelator. He looks at John the Beloved, as John calls it, John the disciple whom the Lord loved. Of course, John wrote that, but the Lord allowed him to do that. He says, what about him? What about John? Because there was a rumor that John would be alive when Jesus Christ returned. Real misunderstanding. What he was saying was, John's going to be the longest living apostle. He lived to his, in, into his 90s, but with third degree, degree burns all over his body. He was in exile on the island of Patmos. Patmos. I mean, he went through a lot of things. He said, what about him? And Jesus came up with the greatest question, man. He said, what's that to you? <laughs> what's that to you? If I choose that he's going to be here all the way till my return, it's none of your business. But this is what I want you to see about Yom Teruah. There was a belief that if you were still alive when the Messiah returned, you're in a preferential position. And so right here, 1 Thessalonians 4 is saying, wait a minute. Whether you are dead or whether you're alive, here's some good news. No preferential treatment. In fact, what does it say? The dead in Christ will what? Rise first. Absolutely. So anyway, will we be found ready? That's the whole concept of the, of, of the festival of blowing. This is an appointed festival. Will we be found ready? Now you have what's called the Baal Tekia. Baal Tekia. That's the one who blows the shofar. He stands in the center of the synagogue. Now this is important on an elevation, and his prayer shawl, his tzitzit, his talis, his prayer shawl, is drawn far over his head. Now, he's about to do something very interesting here as he stands there, holding the curved instrument, oops, pressed gently to his lips, with all his power, he makes a shofar sound that is clear and distinct. Notice the shofar has no metal mouthpiece or stops or reed, for that matter. The natural horn is shaped by immersion, but the nine sounds of alarm are created by holding the shofar obliquely to the lips and blowing with regulated force. It is a beautiful thing. Now, the three principal sounds are Tekiya, Teruka. 
Shivarim or Shivarim. Shivarim or with, and then they do a Shivarim with a Teruah. Teruah. Yom Teruah. Important. A series of 30 blasts would continue in quick succession and was called at the end the Great Tekiah. The trumpet will blast. The dead in Christ, those united with Messiah, will rise first. And we which remain, the living, the only difference is so shall we join them, be caught up with the Lord, and so shall we be forever with the Lord. And I love this one. Comfort one another with these words. See, friends, when you would blow the trumpet, this is the festival of blowing. That's simple. It begins the 10 days of awe. It begins to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It gives you a point of saying, where am I at with the Lord? But you would always blow the shofar whenever there was an announcement of new moons and festivals. It was a signal for alarms. It was also a call to battle. This is key. At the walls of Jericho, what walls need to come down for you today? They'd yell, Teruah! In the battle, they would use another word for the shout of the Lord, Shabbat! It's another word that speaks of praise and speaks of worship. And so you would, well, there'd be a call to battle, so you would blow the shofar for a stopping of pursuit, the dismissal of an army to return home. I love that. Also, a signal of victory. Teruah is what they heard as a signal of victory. And the walls came a tumbling down at Jericho. It was also an instrument in processions. So when the Jews, I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. This was a time, friends, of preparing for the procession. It was also blown before you would receive offerings presented to the Lord. They would blow the shofar. But now there's this certain time at Yom Teruah, as we get ready for the 10 days of awe, they would blow it before 2 Chronicles 7.14 and asking the question, if my people who are called by my name, are we called by his name? That literally means, is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Will humble themselves, repent, turn from their twisted, perverted, or wicked ways. God says, I'm going to hear from heaven. I'm going to heal your land. Do you think we need this right now? For this presidential election, do you think we need this right now? With what's happening in the streets of America, the riots, do you think we need this right now? When you look at COVID-19, do you think we need this right now? Just a question, just asking, if you will. I want to ask you, is our giving to the Lord, since with every offering they blow the shofar, is our giving to the Lord something to blow a trumpet about? I'm hoping we're going to be blowing, blow the shofar in Zion, Zion. Do you remember the scripture when there was famine in the land? When there was locusts taking over the land, they rush on the city, they run on the wall. Great is the army that carries out his word. Okay, you remember that? Blow the trumpet in Zion, Zion. Sound the alarm in his holy mountain. They blew the trumpet to say, the locusts are coming, the locusts are coming. You see, friends, our, for, they also blew the shofar for proclaiming an important event such as the return of the Messiah. That's the background. That's why when you hear the trumpet will be blown, we just think Gabriel, and we see this trumpet being blown, and there might be a little minor measure of truth then, probably not. But you see, this is actually where we have the Judeo-Christian ethic. This is understanding our foundation and roots. See, the blowing of the shofar was always a sign that God is up to something, if you will. In Israel, it was blown to uh, whenever there be a new ruler ascending to the throne, they would blow the trumpet. In fact, it, it was for the start of a fast. Whoa, before Yom Kippur, before the Day of Atonement, they'd blow the shofar and say we all need to be on the same 
page. You have to hear this today. It's exciting. It was also used to warn the Israelites of the coming natural disasters. You see, when we hear, they rush on the city, they run on the wall, great is the army that carries out his voice. It's actually speaking of locusts, a natural disaster taking over and overcoming, overtaking Israel. The shofar was a call to battle. I want to ask you a question. How many of us today in the 20th century during this 5th, 6th, and 7th Moedim? I'm talking about from the 10 days of awe, from Yom Teruah to Yom Kippur, and then finally Sukkot when Jesus most likely was born. How many of us recognize we're in a war right now? We are in a war right now. Friends, in the whole situation that's taking place in our government right now, we are in a war. Presidential election, we're in a war. Supreme Court, we're in a war. How many of you believe that? We're in a war. These are complicated times. Ephesians 6 verse 11 says, Use all the armor and weaponry that God provides so that you will be able to stand against the deceptive tactics of the adversary. Did you know one of the... um, pieces of weaponry that were used for the Jews during these battle times was the shofar. It's time to attack. It's time to retreat. It's time to herald the victory because the Bible says the victory is the Lord's. It's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Hmm. I love this. So Ephesians 6, 11, let's say it again. Use all the armor and weaponry that God provides, all of it, so that you'll be able to stand against the deceptive tactics of the adversary. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. What does Paul say? I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. It's a fight. It's a battle. I have kept the faith. See, it is a God fight that we're in right now. Guys, some of us in the church are so caught up in COVID. We're so caught up in the political unrest. We're so caught up in all the racial dissension. Friends, is the battle the Lord's? Uh, What what makes this a good fight? Fight the good fight of faith. You know why it's a good fight? Because we win. When I lose a fight, it's not a good fight. (laughs) Same with you. Max Lucado gives a great illustration on the dangers of armies that just stay in the barracks. He says, so many of us in the church, we fight one another, but we do not recognize that we are in a big fight, a great fight. And then he goes on to say, you know what's interesting? In the army, whenever soldiers don't, they're not called to battle, they don't sense the bullets whizzing by their ears. He says, we tend to be in dissension. We tend to fight one another. He says, but when we're in the battle, and this is the problem we're not leading people to Christ. This is the problem we do not realize. Is there not a cause? If not us, then who? If not now, then when? When we don't realize we're in a battle, we tend to get caught up in trivial matters. We tend to get caught up in dissension. He says, but something happens when all of a sudden people are shooting at you. Bullets are whizzing by your ears, almost hitting in the brain there. He says, all of a sudden, we have a whole different mindset. Do you believe we're in a war right now? Grandma, what about for your grandkids? I'm going to ask you, Dad, how about for your sons and your daughters? We're in a battle. We're in a fight. And in the church, we're so caught up with the worship being just right and the air conditioning being just right and the worship center being just right and I have the ministry that I want to have. And when we don't recognize, when we fail to recognize that we're in a battle, we tend to become lackadaisical. We tend to become lazy We tend to get defeated. So the body of Yeshua is in a war. Listen to 1 Peter 5, 8. Stay sober. Stay alert. Your enemy, the adversary, stalks about, Satan here, like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Yom Teruah is a warning sign. We're in a battle. 
We're in a place right now where we have got to come together as the body of Christ and we have to be willing to engage the enemy. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4 through 5. Because the weapons we use to wage war are not worldly. On the contrary, they have God's power for demolishing strongholds and every arrogance that raises itself up against the knowledge of God. We take every thought captive and make it obedient obedient to the Messiah. This may shock you. That's the spirit of Yom Teruah, of Yom Kippur. In determining that our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, it's choose this day who you will serve. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. See, friends, the key to winning a battle, and Yom Teruah shows this, is knowing, issue recognition, who our enemy is. Here's what's interesting about Israel during wartime. If you've ever been to Israel, we Jews will fight about anything. There's an old saying, if you want to ask a Jewish man his opinion, he'll give you 10. <laughs> One, when Jews come together, people argue, well, I'm an Orthodox Jew. You're just a conservative Jew, which makes you lukewarm. And man, you're a Reformed Jew. That makes you apostate. And then we argue, well, is it better to be a Hasidic Jew or a Sephardic Jew or an Ashkenazi Jew or a Juju or whatever the case might be? There's all these battles. But once a Jew realizes there's a war, I'm going to take you to 1956, the Gaza Strip. All these Jews that were in dissension with one another, not getting along, once the enemy came against them, it's amazing they became unified They were on the same page. Friends, here's what's even more fascinating. In 1967, when the Jews were attacked, all of a sudden, there was no such thing as an Orthodox Jew. There was no, there's no, no, who cared if you were a conservative Jew? Nobody cared if you were a Hasidic, Sephardic, or Ashkenazi. You see, friends, we were all Jews. And because there was a battle, because the trumpet was blown, because there was a warning, All of the Jews were on the same page, if you will. How effective of a soldier are we in the battle for the kingdom? Have you noticed how much dissension there is between Calvinists and Arminius, between free will people and between once saved, always saved? Have you noticed how how many battles there are with Pentecostals versus the Baptists? Because I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit, you're not. I speak in tongues, you don't. I believe the gifts are for today, you don't. What would happen? If we as a church, we as a body of believers, said, I don't care if you're black, white, red, yellow, brown, or olive skin. I don't care if you're male or female. I'm not going to argue women in ministry today. We don't have time to do this anymore, friends. Yom Teruah is a call to battle. It is a warning that we are one new man in one battle, if you will. But how effective of a soldier are you during the battles in the kingdom of God? See, winning souls is promoting, and this is key, friends, defections from the enemy's camp. What does that mean? Winning souls is promoting, what did I say? Defections from the enemy's camp. I want you to forget about what religion you are because God never created religion. Religion in Latin means returning to bondage. God never created denominations, whether it's Lutheranism, whether it's Pentecostal, whether it's Wesleyanism, whether it's Catholicism. God never created these lines of demarcation and division and dissension, friends. We're all called to make it as difficult as possible. Blow the trumpet in Zion, Zion. We're to make it as difficult as possible for anybody in our sphere of influence, anybody in our region to go to hell. Now, winning souls, healing and deliverance is releasing people, as we've been talking about in Let's Be Church, healing and deliverance is releasing people from the bondage of the enemy. This is what Yom Teru was all about. The mission of Yeshua was to do what? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news. We're here to release the captives. The mission of Yeshua was to release the captives. It was a battle cry. That's why God said of the seven Moedim, it's important that the fifth Moedim, this one Moedim, before we then bring people to Jesus, 
Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, is to bring people in the new covenant to a better covenant based on sure promises to bring them into the kingdom of God. But there was this blowing of the trumpet saying, we've got to come to unity. We've got to be on the same page. We've got to stop knowing each other by the flesh. We've got to stop having all these ridiculous distinctions. I'm a millennium. No, I'm a Gen Z. No, I'm the great generation. No, I'm the next generation. No, I am the baby boomers. Ridiculous. It's the blowing of the trumpet to come into formation and make sure that we're standing in the gap. We're called to be his physical parts. So I want to ask you a question. Will we heed the call to service? I think some of us are more caught up in services in the church than service for the Lord. The Bible says if you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. He makes it clear we're all called to, to serve. In fact, he says, I'm God. I'm Jesus. I'm your Lord. I'm your Messiah. But I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. Hmm. Will we heed the call to service today? Here it is. 1 Corinthians 4.2. Now, the one thing that is asked of a trustee, I'm taking this from the Hebrew, is that he be found trustworthy. There's one thing the Lord requires of every good stu steward. He must be found faithful. You know, friends, what a tragedy when one servant, one person, doesn't do their job during the battle. You know, have you ever read the story about the Great Wall of China? And literally, it was only one man that would guard the gates, the door to the Great Wall of China. And this man did something unthinkable. He fell asleep as a sentry at his watch. I want to ask you, do you hear the sound of the army of the Lord? This is Yom Teruah, and next year I'm going to get more into this, friends. This is just a little introduction to Yom Teruah. Do you hear? I hear the sound of the army of the Lord. I hear the sound of the army of the Lord. It's a sound of praise. But here's the key. It's a sound of war. The army of the Lord. The army of the Lord. Friends. I think we've got praise down in the church for the most part, but I don't think we have the war down. And that's why we're losing so many of our kids from the kingdom, and they have no regard for God. Do we hear the sound? You see, friends, the trumpet is calling each of us to assume our responsibility in his body. And here's the key. Let's not be found a wall. Absent without leave. Do you remember the Pareto principle? How many of you remember that? Raise your hand if you remember that. The Pareto principle. It says that 20% of the people in any organization, we're talking about the church now, do 80% of the work. 20% of the people give 80% of the money. Friends, can we hear the shofar of the Lord today? I got to ask you that. Can we hear the shofar of the Lord today? He is telling us it's a new day. I've got all these friends who are freaking out over COVID, freaking out over the national debt, all the trillions of dollars that have been added to the debt. But I hear the sound of the army of the Lord. I hear the sound. Look at the shofar, friends. The Lord still uses it. It's still present. He's telling us to stop following the sounds of, of our own or the wrong shofar. The Bible teaches there's a wrong shofar. There's a Christ, there's an antichrist. There's a shofar, there is a godless call. James 4.17 says, so that anyone who knows the right thing to do and fails to do it is committing sin. That's from the Greek. I think the King James says, to him who knows to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. He's telling us, this is the key. Oh, this is the key. This is the key. He's telling us to heed the call to service before the final trumpet, the final shofar blows. How exciting is that? Friends, we have got such grace. God has given us so many warnings through the years. God has blessed us. He's given us 2 Chronicles 7, 14 that we can repent. We can be right with God. But he says, like he told the five foolish virgins, there'll come a day 
the shofar is going to blow. The Lord's going to say, Teru! Ah! And it's over. And the door is closed. I like this. Now, here's an example. Are, are you ready? Should that final trumpet blow, this all will come together next week. Well, most of it will. But I want to remind you, Thomas Aquinas, interesting guy. He was sitting with a group of monastic monks, and they were sitting together, and they were playing a game. Can you imagine that? And these guys, as monks do, they had a conversation. If you knew that the trumpet was going to blow in 15 minutes and the Lord was going to return, what would you do? One guy says, I would fall on my face before God and I would repent of all of my sins. Another guy said, I would run through the streets and tell everybody, you better get saved right now. You better get right with God right now. You know what Thomas Aquinas said? I'd finish the game. <laughs> I'd finish the game. Why did he say that? He fully believed that he was ready for that final trump, that final blast, that when Takiya, Teruwa, when that trumpet, when that shofar blows, he knew he would be ready. Friends, let me tell you something. Your pastor, I'm choosing to live the same today as I would if I knew Yeshua was returning any second. I don't plan on having some come to Jesus moment at the last second because most people never really do that anyway. How will Yeshua find us when he returns? Five foolish virgins, he found them lackadaisical, he found them self-centered, he found them lazy and disengaged. Let me show you something. It's important we see this. A number of years ago on the south side of Chicago when your pastor was five years old, so going back about 10 years or so, right? Uh, my mom and dad for Hanukkah, they got me the coolest gift, a wiffle bat and a wiffle ball. You know the wiffle balls in the air that's displaced through the ball? And my brother and I wanted to play baseball together. My brother's five and a half years older than me, wiser, smarter, she should know better. I was just a kid. He was an old guy of almost 11 years old. And he says, the dining room. Let's go to the dining room, and you stand on one side of the dining room table, and I'm going to pitch you, and then you hit the ball, and we're going to have a blast. And I said, Bob, we're not allowed in the dining room. None of us are allowed. We're only allowed in there for Thanksgiving, for Pesach, when we break the Yom Kippur fast. But, I mean, it was about six, seven times a year, but we were not allowed. I mean, my mother had plastic on all of our furniture. Can you relate to that? And she had, as if somebody cleaned their carpets, she had these plastic runners throughout the house because it was a child-proof house, if you will. And I'll never forget this. My brother pitches the ball. And I picked up the bat, not the shofar. And I kept my eye on it, and I swung it. No, it wasn't me. I just wanted to be the hero. <laughs> I pitched the ball. Here's my brother, that rebellious guy. And he swings it and strike one. What a pitcher I am. It was on the second one. He hits it. Now, my mother had a chandelier over this table that would seat 16 people imported from France. And my brother hit the ball. And I watched it in slow motion and suspended animation, flying through the air. Fly me to my funeral. It was serious. The room we're not supposed to be in. It's not my fault. My mother was teaching kindergarten. She should have been home watching me, right? It went through the chandelier. And there was a glass top on the, it was a wooden table, handcrafted, but it was a glass cover. And all of a sudden, one of the little crystals, you know the little fish hooks there? It literally dislodged from the chandelier. And in slow motions, in slow motion, it wouldn't. It couldn't. Oh, drop kick me, Jesus, I'm afraid it's going to. And I watched it move ever so slowly towards the glass tabletop 
and it hit the glass tabletop and it was like an explosion. I needed a God word at five and a half years of age. I looked at my brother and said, look what you did. Look what you did. And my brother looked at me and says, if you tell mom about this, we're going to put the coasters on it. We're going to cover it right now. They were custom coasters. She won't notice it until the next holiday. And here it is. See no evil, speak no evil, think no evil. We know nothing about it. I says, but Bob, you did it. He says, you are going to die in your sleep with my assistance. I still remember the conversation. If you say a word. Well, there it was. You know, mothers have this weird sick, or is it six, sense. She comes home and we never go in there. What led this little four foot nine woman to make her way in there and lift up the coasters? And she looks at the table and the shattered glass and the messed up chandelier. I'll never forget, mothers have a tendency to know full names at times like this. I'll never forget when I heard Robert Philip Wolfson. And then the last words I thought I would ever hear on this side of eternity, William Paul Wolfson. And my brother looks at me, don't you say a word or today will be your last day on this planet. I'm not kidding you. So I went in there. And I stood in there, and he stood there about two feet from me. We were practicing social distancing, even back then. And my mother said, what happened? And my brother's great. He's a lawyer. You know how he is. He says, Mom, what are you talking about? We haven't been in the dining room since Thanksgiving. What, 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 what's up? What's going on? And she looked at me and said, William Paul Wolfson, I'm giving you one chance my mother, she, you know, she's Jewish, and she's tough and tiny. She's part of the, uh, what I call the Jewish kosher, no, kosher nostra. She's a dangerous woman, man. She looked at me and said, you tell me the truth, and you'll be fine, Billy. But if you don't, but I'm a man of covenant. I'm a man of integrity. You wild horses couldn't drag the truth out of me in this situation because I live in the same room with that guy. And I said to my mother, he did it. He did it. My brother played a Ludwig drum set back in those days. And I never realized there are other things a mother can do with drumsticks. I'm not sure in his 60s that my brother has sat down since. Friends, here's the reality. Here's the reality. I look back at that situation. I didn't know when mom was returning. I didn't know what was going to happen. But friends, in that situation, I was far from ready. Do you know we all need Yom Teruah in our lives? We all need a wake-up call. And the reality that we don't have all the time in the world to do his will is key. C.S. Lewis in his book, The Screwtape Letters, about how demonic activity works against us, the hosts of hell. It's really an incredible book. I highly recommend it, friends. He says, ultimately, here's the real key, and here's the strategy of the hosts of hell. We don't have to convince people there's no Jesus. They're already going to believe in Jesus. Don't worry about that. Tell them they're right. We don't have to try to stop them from being so spiritual. All we have to do is convince them they have all the time in the world. And listen to me, friends. Whether you're Gen Z, whether you're a millennial today, whether you are Generation Next, whether you're a baby boomer, or whether you're part of the great generation, so many of us, we live our life as if there's no shofar, as if 1 Thessalonians 4 is not true and they'll never be the blowing of the trumpet. You know, friends, we need a reality. We need a wake-up call. We all need Yom Teruahs. We all need the spirit of Yom Teruah in our life. A reality that we don't have all the time in the world to do his will. And Jesus said, my meat is to do my Father's will. You know, I want you to just think right now. The Jew... When they heard that shofar, they actually imagined, what if we only have 10 days? And I want you to do this during these 10 days of awe. Imagine right now we only have 10 days and then Jesus returns. 
What if we were to heed the call to service when the master calls? What does the Bible say? Find us faithful. One day, we're going to give an account for our deeds. So let me leave you with these last thoughts and we're done. Hear the shofar today as it challenges us to do the will of the Father. The Lord says, once you hear this initial shofar on the Temple Mount, I want you to realize there's a heaven to be gained and a hell to be shunned. I want you to make sure you don't sleep in when we hear reveille. Isn't what's interesting? The Bible talks about in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, there will be those who will be asleep when the shofar blows. The five foolish virgins were asleep. They were ill-prepared when the shofar blew. May our lamps not be lacking oil when our groom blows the final trumpet. Friends, there's more I'd like to tell you, but not right now. I mean, today I've, I've preached a lot longer than I normally do. How many of you got something out of this today? Are you getting anything out of this at all? I pray that you are. Here it is. I'm going to leave you this right now. Do not miss Friday at 5 p.m. in the Zoom room as we talk about the Day of Atonement. Friends, I know a lot of my Gentile friends love to celebrate Yom Kippur, and you fast, and yet you've forgotten a major ingredient. Jesus is Lord. Jesus paid it all. To Jesus Christ, I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain, but Jesus has cleansed it. He's eradicated it. He's blotted it out, and he's made you and me white as snow. But I want you to be ready for Friday in that Zoom meeting. You be there. Afterwards, I'm probably going to do also, so you be ready for this, a Yom Kippur Facebook Live, just about 20 or 25 minutes to really share some concepts here. And then next Sunday night, please don't miss this. Please don't miss this next Sunday night because we're going to look at Yom Kippur and we're going to realize it's not the Day of Atonement for us, not for the church. It's the day of blotting out. It's the day of cleansing. It's not a day of covering our sins. It's not temporary. It's blotting them out and washing them, cleansing them, eradicating them. Friends, I'm going to see you in the Zoom room. We're going to open it up here in just a minute or two, but at quarter to eight Pacific time. And I want to ask you today, can you hear the shofar? Can you hear the sound of the army of the Lord? Are you AWOL today? Friends, I believe God is calling us into a new sacred and significant and sanctified level of intimacy with Him. And I want to remind you right now, wherever you're at, if you do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, you just say, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. And now that we're hearing this trumpet, here's my question. The oil represents the Holy Spirit and the anointing of God, the rubbed on, rubbed on presence of God. When he returns, make that decision. You'll be ready. And be like Joshua's. For me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And as always, remember, God's favor is on you. I love you guys so much. God bless you.